Hi, I'm Lucas Ashley. I'm the lead pastor here at the Bridge Church, and just want to say thank you for taking some time to uh, join us in the message today. Um, but we want you to first of all know that we're just really praying that today's message is just simply a tool that the Holy Spirit uses to encourage you in your growth in your journey with Him. Um, but really what we're hoping is that it's a tool that is used in partnership with you being plugged into a local church community. Whether that's here with us in Bradenton or wherever it is that you might be watching from. We love anytime we can be an encouragement to somebody, but we know that that's what we're called to do is be a part of a local community and a local church. Um, but if it is a source of blessing in your life today, we just wanna encourage you to do three simple things. First and foremost, thank God for it. Any bit of encouragement or blessing that we can be is simply the Holy Spirit at work in your life today. So make sure you thank God for all that's going on in, or in and around your life. Um, but second is feel free to share it. You can share a link to the message or just share it through conversation as you're talking to people about how the Lord is working in and around your life. Um, but then also share it with us. We love to hear stories of how the Holy Spirit is working in people's lives in and outside of our community. You can do that real simply by emailing us at amen at bridgechurchfl.com. Um, and then you can also just follow along, whether that's subscribing to our page or follow us on social media to see what all the Lord is doing through the ministries here at the Bridge Church. Um, and last but certainly not least, if you'd like to partner with us financially as we continue to partner with the Lord and bringing hope to those in our community and globally, you can do so by giving through our website. It's bridgechurchfl.com slash give. We're praying for you today and hope today's message is a source of blessing and encouragement for you. Man, aren't you glad you came to church? Sheesh. But we finna have some fun today. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Shelly. Uh, hey, good morning. Uh, excited to be here with you. Um, this morning, if we've never had the privilege uh, of meeting before, uh, my name is Mike. I get the honor and the privilege of being the student pastor. I get to lead an incredible group of students that are uh, going to change the world, and uh, they're awesome. And um, and uh, I'm just gonna, uh, you know, normally sp addressing controversy is not my style. Josh, <laughs> and. Uh, I'm not. It's so, uh, my name is Mike. I'm not Pastor Josh. And uh, it's good to be here. Some of you guys got really worried for a minute. You were like, what's he about to say? <laughs> All right. Josh is in Africa. If you need to know the difference, just ask us to smile. And uh, you'll tell the difference pretty quick. Uh, and if you laugh at that, I'm going to see you later. And... Uh, uh, I'm excited to be able to preach. We're in a series that I've been loving. Uh, we started last week called Dangerous Theology. Uh, where, yeah, where we've been uh, really taking uh, truths that are found, truths, statements that are found in culture, the world, and just asking ourselves the question, is it wise to live our lives through this lens? And man, I thought Pastor Luke uh, knocked it out of the park last week when he introduced this series uh, just with the idea of live your truth and what, where that comes from. And if you've missed that, I want to I encourage you, go back and watch it uh, because he nailed it. Just the reality of all truth comes from God. And th there was just some one-liners. I'm like, man, that was good. And so I want to encourage you, go back um, to that. And today, um, I want to continue on that journey. But I want to talk to you this morning about the decisions that we make. And I ain't gonna lie, I'm gonna be all up in your business today. And uh, we're gonna have fun today because uh, this is what the Lord's been doing to me. And so if he's doing it to me, guess what? He's gonna do it to you today too. Uh, so I'm not by myself today. Um, but I wanna think about the decisions that we make. We make a lot of decisions in life, don't we not? And uh, I, I recently did a, a study on decisions, and I want to just take a guess. What do you think the average person, how many decisions do you think the average person makes a day? 3,225. 3,225. Oddly specific, but I like 400,000. That would be crazy. That's awesome. The average person ranges somewhere between 33 to 35,000 decisions a day. And you might be like, Who, how do I have enough time to do that a day? But think about it for a second, right? The moment you wake up in the morning, you're faced with a decision, right? Do I hit the snooze button for the fifth time? Or do I wake up and start my day, right? 
And then once I wake up, right, like do I check my phone? Do I scroll for a while? Do I go to the bathroom? Do I brush my teeth? Do I do that in reverse? Do I take a shower? Do I, who am I gonna, who am I gonna text? Do I go for a run? And like you see how these are already starting to stockpile and you haven't even gotten out of your metaphorical bed yet, right? All these decisions that we make in our life. And here's really what I believe this morning. I believe that whatever, wherever you are in your journey of faith, whether you are brand new to faith and you've just kind of figure out life, or maybe you came out the womb loving Jesus uh, and you've just been following him your whole life, I believe this message can help some of you today. Maybe you're like me and you're kind of somewhere in the middle of that where God's still in the process of redeeming our stories. And I really believe that through this series and what we're going to find in God's word today, I think it's going to help us make some good decisions. Because here's really what I believe, and I don't have this on the screen, but write this down. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of your decisions. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of your decisions. We make decisions every day, but are those decisions leading us in the right direction? Some decisions are great. Some decisions aren't. And then there's kind of like those seasons in the middle. You ever been, this ever been you before? You ever been faced with something where you're just not sure what to do? Right, you're like, I don't really know how to get out of this. I don't really know how to deal with that. And, and that can be difficult, but listen to me. In those seasons, where you choose to go to for wisdom matters. Right? We, we can get our wisdom from pop culture. We can get our wisdom from social media. We can get our wisdom from news cycles. We can get our, me, our information, our wisdom from music or movies. But we can also get it from the word of God. And so I, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't think anything in this message today is going to shock you when we talk about the, the topic that we're talking about today. Because I have the luxury to address the dangerous theology of follow your heart. Follow your heart. Raise your hand if you've ever told somebody to follow their heart. What's the matter with you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> follow your heart. This is something we hear all the time, right? This is something that the world says to us all the time. You're not sure who to date? Follow your heart. You want to know what's true about who you really are? Just follow your heart. Don't know what to do next in a season? Just follow your heart. Um, one of my spiritual gifts uh, of the life of our church is disappointing you by the amount of movies I haven't seen, right? And we don't need to get into all that. Um, but one of the movies I did see for the first time this year was Mulan, the cartoon. And um, for example, it's, um, and there's this like statement that she makes in the movie, right? Where she like does some heroic thing. I don't remember what she does. And then they were like, what was that? And she was like, I remembered that my duty was to my heart. Uh, right? <laughs> And I'm like, man, I don't know about you, but like that's dangerous theology to think about. Like your duty is to your heart. I don't want to always follow my heart, right? Sometimes my following my heart leads me into a ditch. Man, I can think of moments in my own life where, where following my heart was just not the decision to make. And let me just lay it out plainly. I think one of the worst decisions you can make in your life is follow your heart. So what do we do? What do we do about that? Because I want to give you some hope. I don't want to be the guy that's up here and just being like, tell your heart to shut up and let's pray, okay? Like, I want to actually help you this morning. Because how many of you know, following Jesus as we're on this journey together requires us to make some decisions, right? I love what Pastor Luke set up yesterday or last week when he talked about that verse in John, right? The thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come so that you would have life and life to the full, you know where you won't find life to the full? Following your heart. And so what do we do? And so I want to help us today, followers of Jesus. And, and I'll be honest, I expect this from the world. Right? I'm not shocked that like this is the posture of the world. Uh, but I do think it's dangerous theology because we have stuff like this seeping into the body. We've got people in the church, and, and probably in the name of, of best intentions, leading people in a path that I think is doing more harm than good. I don't think followers of Jesus are meant to follow our heart. I think we're meant to lead our hearts. And I don't think we're meant to just lead our hearts. I think we're just supposed to, we are called to lead our hearts back to the one that designed our hearts. Well, I'm not just following my heart anywhere. I've got to follow it to the one that knows my heart better than I do. And so I want to help you today. I want to get really practical. I want to give you four ways to lead your heart this morning. If you're with me, say I'm ready. 
I'm ready. Here we go. Point number one, I think if we're going to understand how to lead our hearts, we have to question your heart. Because here's what the Bible says about the heart. There's so, listen, I could, I could go on and on about how many verses are in the heart. God really cares about the posture of your heart, okay? But here's one that we find in Jeremiah, starting in verse seven, or chapter 17 to 9. This is what the Bible says. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. So who can understand it? Like, let's just take that verse at, at face value. You wouldn't follow a boss You wouldn't work for a boss that was willingly deceitful above all things, right? Like if you went on a first date with somebody and you were like, tell me a little bit more about yourself and they open up with, girl, let me tell you what, I am deceitful beyond all things. (laughs) I'm sick and nobody, I'm confusing. You're going to love me. I'm like, I'll take the check. Thanks, right? Like you're not going on a second date with that person. Right, if I looked at my son who's three going on 15 and he's like set up for life and I'm just like looking at him, I go, okay, Mavi, listen, you're about to go into a new season of life. Maybe you're starting school. Here's what I want you to know about your teachers, okay? They are deceitful above all things. They are sick and no one can cure them. Good luck, buddy. See you, have a blessed day. I love you, right? What the heck, right? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Good parenting, bad parenting. Yeah, right? You suck, right? But yet this is what we tell everybody, like this is what you should do. You should follow that leader. That's your leader. Follow your heart. Do what you feel. I think it's really a dangerous game when we are led by how we feel. And sometimes there's just moments in my life where I can think about the the moments where I've just followed my heart and where that's led me in my life. Sometimes following my heart and doing what I feel like in the moment has required me to make some permanent decisions based off of some temporary emotions. Right? Sometimes I just get quick at the mouth. I'm the youngest of five. I couldn't fight for a while, so I had to be good at speaking, right? I had to be good. I had to get quick with the mouth, right? And sometimes following my heart got me whoop, right? <laughs> like, some people don't understand that now because that's like a felony, but... My mom handled her business, you know what I'm saying? But follow your heart. We don't, I don't want to always follow my heart. I want to question my heart. I want to be suspicious of my heart. Yeah. I want to know, why am I doing this? I think that would save us a lot of heartache. When we're faced with a decision, we just stop for a moment and go, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this really? Like, why am I talking to this guy really? Why am I buying this house Really? Why am I wearing this? Why am I exposing myself to this? Why am I walking through this life? Why am I still in this relationship even though I know it's not good for me? Really? And I think if we just learn how to question our heart, question our motives, and not just question it for the sake of questioning it, but then offer it as a chance of surrender to go, God, I don't know my own heart, but I know you do. I need some wisdom. Right? I think sometimes the question we've got to ask ourselves is what's the wise thing to do? Hey, what's the wise thing to do? And I know it sounds awesome to follow your heart, right? Like that's almost, like it sounds so awesome, right? Like I almost want to do it. Like follow your heart, you're like, yeah! But like, man, that's, we've got to really be careful with that kind of thinking. I don't want to live my life based off of something that's stitched on a pillow. Like follow your heart. Like, I want to lead my heart. I want to question my heart. I want to examine my heart, right? I love it when David's like, search my heart. Right, like, like know my heart. I I don't want to just be like, I follow my heart. You want to know what happened to David when he followed his heart? He saw a girl bathing on a rooftop, got her pregnant, got her baby, got his baby daddy killed. That's what happens when you follow your heart. Now, I'm not saying you following your heart is going to result in that same story. But I want you to understand the dynamic. Man, he, his heart was off of the call of God and it moved towards his comfort. So we've got to question our hearts. So we're not going to follow our heart. We're going to lead our hearts through questioning the motives of our hearts. Then we're going to do something that is interesting. We have to set our heart. We've got to set our heart. Right? I love how Paul writes to the church in Colossae uh, when he says this, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart. Somebody say, set your heart. Set your heart. 
on things above. Where Christ is, he's seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And I love how Paul just makes this clear. He says, hey, I want you to remember that you are not your own. I want you to remember who Jesus is, and I want you to remember what Jesus has done for you. And because when you remember who Jesus is and what he's done for you, this is what you do. You set your hearts on him. You have to set your heart towards the heart of the Father. We have to set our hearts to the heart of a good and gracious God who made us. And so many times, I think we can get really quickly out of tune with God. I've had some seasons in my own life where I was like, man, I just don't feel in tune with you. Anybody else in the room? You're like, yeah, right? Sometimes I follow my own heart and I look back and I go, how did I get here? Let me illustrate it like this for you. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to sing to you. Don't worry. Okay. Let me turn this thing on. Okay, this is a guitar, right? Now, this guitar is set, right? It's set a specific way to play in a specific way to produce a specific sound, right? So a lot of times, I don't know about you, but this is how I kind of think about my relationship with God. I think about my relationship with God like a dance, like a song, like a melody. And sometimes I want to be in unison with God. And sometimes there's just moments where it sounds awesome. Is this thing on? Is this thing on? Yeah, it is. Hey. It sounds awesome. And I'm, I'm doing what God wants me to do and I'm obeying what God wants me to say, and I'm fasting, and I'm reading my Bible, and I'm, and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm just, I feel really in tune with God right now. And then something happens, and then we get distracted. You get a medical diagnosis you weren't expecting. Somebody walks away from you in your life some kind of mistake happens and you're like, I have no idea how it happened. And then we take our focus off of the song that God is inviting us to sing alongside of him and we look over here and we get distracted and then watch what happens. Sometimes the enemy comes and he just kind of, just one little offense. Maybe a friend offended you and you're like, hmm. Maybe your boss fired you you're like, mm, I'm coming into office and there's going to be hell to pay, right? Something happens. There's an addiction. There's some secret sin in your life that you don't have anybody to confess to. See, the problem is we think we can set it and forget it. But a lot of times, we get really out of tune pretty quickly. And then we go on about our life. Yeah, Jesus! Come on, let's stand and worship today. Come on, come on. Right. And we're just living our lives out of tune. And sometimes we get out of tune and we go, man, you know, something's not right. You know, something's not, something doesn't sound the way it used to. Something doesn't feel the way it used to. I wish things could just go back to the way they used to be. Oh, I know. I know how to fix it. I need a new guitar. Something's going on with your marriage and you're back at Guitar Center looking at options. No, I think what happens is we need to get back in tune with God's design for your marriage, with God's design for your life, with God's design for your finances, with God's design for your character. But so many times we're often quick to just go, something doesn't work the way I want it to, so I'm just gonna replace it. I'll just walk away from it. It's, this, it's not me, it's the guitar's fault. 
and a lot of times following your heart, at least for me, has gotten me the most out of tune in my life. Where I had made some decisions where I was like, dang. Somebody cuts me off on the road, right? Sometimes I get in the car and my wife's like, are you sure you love Jesus? Right? But Paul tells the church in Colossians to set your heart on things above. Set your heart on what's true. Set your mind on the things of God. And so many times if we follow our heart, a lot of times what we're doing is slowly untuning our hearts back to the creator, away from the creator. And so what we have to do a lot of the times is to turn back to what's true. Everybody say hi to Mr. Mark. Okay. Now, Mark is on a digital instrument. Okay? Here's what that means. That means there is no way that that instrument can get out of tune. Right? Like, this one can get out of tune because it's not digital. Sometimes this thing gets out of tune because of the season it's in. Hello. Sometimes the se- this thing gets out of tune because of its conditions and its environments. We tuned this thing back up, ready for it to go for the 11 o'clock, and the cold already started to like untune one of the strings, right? Sometimes it's your conditions. Are you surrounding yourself with people that are untuning your heart? Are you inviting some things into your life that are just... You don't need, you don't need that. You don't need godly living. No, you just need to follow your heart. You don't need God's plan for your marriage. You just need to follow your heart and do what makes you happy. There's a psychologist who says, we live in a world of something called expressive individualism, where you do what makes you happy and I'll do what makes me happy. And if there's anything that makes me as happy as I can be, it's my heart, it's my responsibility to chase that thing down as much as I can. That's dangerous theology. Because what if the thing that you're pursuing and hopes to make you happy Is killing you. It's complicated. Hey, what happened with so and so and you? Oh, it's complicated. And a lot of times we have to look back and go, okay, I know what's true. Mark's instrument is true. So if I say, okay, God, what do you want me to do with my life? And God says, Okay, God. Okay, Lord, you want me to forgive that person? Even though it would be really easy to just block them and pretend that nothing happened? All right, I'll do it. God, what do you want me to do? And he says, man, I want you to start making a difference in the lives of people. So I want you to start serving. I want you to go serve in Bridge Kids. You should, they're all, that's a good team. Okay, I'll do it, Lord. Because here's the thing about obedience. Here's the thing about retuning. Retuning is gonna require a little bit of tension. Like in order for me to make this thing back to its state, I've gotta be okay with it being a little tense. I've got to pull this thing back to a place where it's back in tune, and that will always require tension. Is there somebody that you need to make a phone call with today and go, hey, can we have a conversation? It might be a little tense, but it's getting you back in tune. All right, Lord, what do you want from me next? God, I I feel stuck. You want me to live generously? Even though the money is funny? Okay, God, I'll do it. You want me to pray for my enemies? But they deserve it. And here's the thing, right? Just, just point to who's true, whose notes are actually true, right? Like a lot of times what happens is we get out of tune and then we want God to go, God, come on. This is the right way to go. This is the right way to do it. But if he's playing this chord, Play E. 
and I'm wrong, we ha- I have to come to him. You see, God's not gonna lower his standards to fit your situation. Sometimes we've gotta go back to God and go, okay, God, you want me to, you want my life to be marked by faithfulness. I'm gonna do that. Because you're right, because your way is better than my ways. I know I wanna follow my heart right now, but I know that that will leave me in some tricky waters. So I'm gonna tune my heart back to you. Sometimes it's hard. There's tension in the tuning. And apparently I can't tune a guitar. Go ahead. (laughs) Hey, there it is. There it is, we got it. There it is, hey, we got it, we figured it out, we figured it out. We gotta retune our hearts back towards the Lord. It's not enough to just replace it. You gotta retune it. That's what the Bible means when you set your heart on things above. Right? I love when the Apostle Paul says, then Christ who is seated at the right hand of the Father, and when he is your life, I love that. Like if you have a translation, like underline that where it says, Christ who is your life. You're like, what does that mean? You know like the people who walk around with the shirts that say like music is life. Right, we've got some students in there that play ball, right? Ball is life, right? It's almost like Paul is saying, I want your life to be so centered around the goodness of God. I want your life to be so full with the mercy of God. I want your life to be marked by faithfulness. I want your life to be filled with the faithfulness of Jesus. And that can't happen if you're following your heart. Because a lot of times what happens is when we follow our heart, we get disconnected from God because our minds and our hearts are set on other things. It's something called idolatry. It means that you love something more than the one that loves you ultimately, right? I mean, you look at scripture all across the board. Jesus says a good person does a good thing out of the posture of a good heart, right? When he look, like, you can look at what you love. What, what is your heart set on this morning? Because I don't know about you, but I want my life to be set on the things of God. I want my life to be set on the faithfulness of God. I don't want my life to be set on my own ways. I need to set it back to God. So we're gonna tune back to truth. I'm not following my heart. I'm leading my heart through following God's heart for us. The next thing is simple, but really difficult. Because I think the next way we can lead our heart is by guarding our heart. Guard your heart. Proverbs 4, I love what Solomon says. He says, and he's talking to his son. He says, guard your heart above all else for everything you do flows from it. If you notice in scripture that all the ones that we've read so far, right, especially in Jeremiah and in Proverbs, there's this, there's this relationship between the, the, the phrasing guard your heart and this relationship to like everything else. You notice that, right? So above all else, guard your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things. There is this emphasis that the Bible is putting on the scripture saying, man, your heart is the most important part of you. And if the enemy can't have your soul because it's been saved by the goodness of Jesus, he will do everything he can to get your heart in mind. He'll do anything he can. So you've got to guard your heart. Like That means nothing is getting in. And if it is getting in, then it's got to get out. We've got to have like some TSA pre-checks at the stations of our hearts, right? Why is this important, right? It, because you guard what's valuable. Like some of you guys have like security measures in your home because you want to, why? Because something that's inside of it has value. You want to protect what's valuable. Listen, your heart is valuable. You've got to look at what comes in and what goes out. Uh, I was on a run the other day. And I do this run where I run from here and I run the island. Okay, so I got to the Cortez Bridge and I looked out and, you know, you kind of get to the Cortez Bridge and you see all the boats out there, right? And they're like, it's awesome. But every now and then you see like the one that's like sunken halfway, right? You're like, man, that's a bummer, right? But how many of you know that ships don't sink because of the water surrounding it? It sinks because of what gets in it. 
Are you sinking this morning? Maybe the question is, what's in my heart? What, what am I doing? How am I living my life? Maybe there's some ways for me to, to guard my heart. Maybe I've got to take a good inventory of what I'm listening to, what I'm watching, what I'm exposing myself to, right? We tell our students, garbage in, garbage out, right? You can't listen to music that's like exploiting women and then be like, I just want a faithful marriage that honors God, right? Like, come on, dude. <laughs> Like, we've got to get to a place where our heart is guarded. Because here's what's true. The quality of your life is determined by the quality of your decisions. But the quality of your decisions is determined by the condition of your heart. It starts in the heart. The heart of the matter is always a matter of the heart. So we've got to guard our hearts. That helps us make some, or really does helps us not make some permanent decisions on some temporary feelings. I don't know about you, but I've got like a spiritual gift of overreacting sometimes. Right? Make a little thing a big thing, right? <gasps> what? Right? Relax. Sometimes I gotta guard my heart. Sometimes I gotta just like let things go. Sometimes I've just gotta allow God to do a work in my heart. And so we're not gonna follow our hearts, we're gonna lead our hearts by guarding our hearts. And here's what I wanna say as we begin to wrap up. I was having a conversation with somebody uh, a couple weeks ago, and he heard I was preaching on this series, and he was like, oh, what are you talking about? And I was like, yeah, I'm preaching on this idea of follow your heart, right? And he was like, but why would you tell them not to follow your heart? It's in the Bible. And I was like, well, yeah, but like, not like that. And he's like, yeah, dude, Ecclesiastes, dude, it tells you to follow your heart and do whatever makes you happy. And I was like, man, that can't be right. And I went back in Ecclesiastes, and I was like, oh, man, this is what gets people in trouble all the time. Because, yes, it's in there, but it's not the entire verse. And sometimes I think we live our complete lives with half-finished statements and go, well, it's in the Bible, so I've got to just do it. The Bible says follow your heart. Let me read it to you. I'm going to read it in NIV. And I'm going to read it again in NLT. The NLT is the one on the screen. That one's not coming up yet. So, but, just, but just listen to this as I just read this. Imagine this. Ecclesiastes 9, starting in verse uh, 11, starting in verse 9. You who are young, be happy. Be happy while you're young, and let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth. Follow the ways of your heart and whatever your eyes see. And that's where we stop and go, see, it's in there. It's in there. Solomon told me to do, right? It's in here. But that's not how the verse ends. And we can't read the Bible in a vacuum. We've got to look at the entire thing in its context and understand what kind of life does God want me to live? Because here's what happens next. But know for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. So then banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body for youth and vigor are meaningless. Let me read it to you, NLT. Young people, it's wonderful to be young. All the young people said, amen. That was a test. I wanted to see who would say amen. Enjoy every minute of it. Do whatever you want to do. Take it all in. But remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. So refuse to worry, keep your body healthy, and remember that youth with the whole life before you is meaningless. So what he's, basically what he's saying is, is it okay to follow your heart? Yes, as long as your heart is connected to godly living. See, what happens a lot of the time is we follow our heart and disconnect from the heart of the Father. Like, we, we, we do this, okay, and so, like, here's, like, when was the last time because I felt like it was ever a good reason to do something? That wasn't marked by generosity. That wasn't marked by faithful living. My son, I was, I was in here praying last night, and then Krista called me, and she said, hey, Maverick did something this morning, or tonight. I said, what did he do? And she told me that he went, and I think she probably set him up for success on this, where, like, he put some of the toys that he had in a box and put it on the porch to give to a family. And uh, I talked to him later that night. I said, Maverick, why would you do that? And he went, because I wanted to. Sometimes, if I'm honest, I miss that about my faith. 
Sometimes I can just overcomplicate things. Sometimes I have to have a childlike faith and go, man, sometimes, God, I want to bless people because I feel like it. I want to practice following Jesus because I feel like it. I don't want to always just do things that I feel like doing. I want faithfulness to be the filter, not foolishness to be the filter of my life. So listen, is it okay to have hearts? Is it okay to have desires? 100%. It's okay to have desires. As long as those desires are connecting you to godliness, you don't disconnect from godliness in hopes to follow your heart. You can follow your heart in hopes to connect it to godliness. And listen, that choice is up to us. So we're not gonna follow our heart. We're gonna lead our hearts by taking responsibility to have a heart of godliness. Like we have to give an account for the life we live. Like one day we are all gonna stand before God and give an account for our life. And I want my life to be marked. Hey, what did you do with the talent I gave you? I don't know, I just followed my heart. Hey, what did you do with that wife that I gave you and and those boys that I blessed you with? Oh, well, I just... I don't know, I just follow my heart, right? I don't want that to be the testimony of my life. Like Jesus is inviting us into a, a something so much more beautiful than just following our heart. He's inviting us back to him. He's inviting us back into his goodness, his character, his plan for our life. So what kind of decisions are you making this morning, this afternoon now? And so here's what I want us to do. We're gonna stand in a few minutes and we're gonna worship and we're gonna respond today uh, in the goodness of who God is. And I just wonder if there are some people that just need a moment with God where they can get real about where their heart is. Where they can confess, man, my heart is just not in a place where I want it to be. And I've been living my life from that filter and like, because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says everything you do flows from your heart. Everything you do, every choice you make, every decision comes from the heart. So what are we gonna do? We're not gonna follow our heart. We're gonna lead our heart. And we're not just gonna lead our heart anywhere. We're gonna lead our hearts back to the one that created our heart. We're gonna lead our hearts back to the heart of a loving father. That when we get it wrong, that when we're out of tune, is willing and ready to take us back and go, love you, so glad you're back home, let's get to work. Like for some of you, maybe that's the posture. The reason why you haven't tuned your heart back to God is because you think the minute you go back to God, God's gonna be like, it's about time you showed up, buddy. What were you thinking? But that's not the heart of God. The heart of God is always good. The heart of God is always compassionate, even in the midst of correction and conviction. Because did you know conviction is a gift from the Holy Spirit? Because conviction is just the Holy Spirit allowing you to see the truth of who you are and hopes to bring you back into right standing with God and this people. I don't know about you, but I don't want to follow my heart. I want to leave my heart. That takes work. That's not just work that we have to do. There's a lot of it. Tuning my heart back to God has looked like me just resting in who he is in my life. Like I would love to tell you there's like a secret sauce to just tune your heart back to God. And a lot of it is really just like, man, rest. Practice generosity. Practice gratitude. Tune your heart back to the little things that reflect the glory of God. Set your hearts on God. So we're going to stand and we're going to worship this morning out of the goodness of who that God is. And I'm convinced that one of the things and one of the reasons why we get so out of tune is because we forget. It happens. So I love the first line in this song. Because the first line is, may I never lose the wonder of your presence. Have you lost your wonder this morning? Have you lost your sense of purpose this morning? Have you lost who you are this morning? I want to encourage you. It's found in Jesus. Your identity is not found in following your heart. Your identity is found in the truth of God and his word. So Father, I love you, and I thank you for how faithful you've been. 
I'm thankful for how good you are, Lord, I thank you for, even in the ways where, Lord, we've gotten it wrong, Lord, you are quick to forgive us in good love. Lord, I pray for my friends in the room, God, who have some decisions to make, God, that they wouldn't just follow their feelings, but God, they would follow your heart for them as you lead them. Father, I thank you for how faithful you are to us and how good you are to us. And Father, I pray for the next few moments we turn our eyes on you. Reveal things to us, God. Remind us of who we are. God, if there's anyone in here and they've forgotten who you are, Lord, I pray they would remind themselves of who they are in you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.